All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar. April's webinar. Oh, first, sorry, let me introduce myself. My name is Cassandra Theogene, Executive Assistant for BIAD. I will be your host for this presentation. Today, our top topic <laughs> is cognitive behaviors. Our presenter today is Maggie Kalanick from Defy Therapy Services. Before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping rules. If any of you should have a question, please insert your question in the chat, bo chat box below, which should be on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Simply type your question and we will answer the questions at the end of the presentation so that everybody can have a good presentation today. And lastly, if any materials are shared during this presentation, an email will go out to everybody registered to this webinar with the um, materials in hand and any need to know, any need to know <laughs> handouts and guides. Um, oops, sorry guys, went too fast. All right, today's speaker is Maggie Kalanick is a speech, she is a speech language pathologist passionate about rehabilitation and acquired brain injury. She completed her undergraduate, her undergraduate studies at the University of Maryland, received her master's at the University of Texas, Dallas in 2011, and obtained her ACHA certificate of clinical competence in 2012. Maggie started her career in Baylor Rehab Hospital Day Neuro Program, working with adults with acquired brain injury. Then Maggie relocated in 2013 back home to Delaware to join the Moore's Pediatric Rehab Team. During her career, Maggie has worked to specialize in assessing and treating cognitive communication in disorders. Maggie, help me out with this, dysphagia. Yep, dysphagia. <laughs> and the management of traits and events. Maggie's goal in starting her private practice, Defy Therapy Services, is to help meet the ongoing needs of survivors and caregivers, post-acute and rehab stages. Maggie is excited to work towards building a better network and support for those with brain injury in the state of Delaware. And next, we couldn't let this presentation go by without thanking our sponsors. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Blueprints for the Community. We truly appreciate your support. Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield Delaware is pleased, was pleased to award the Brain Injury Association of Delaware with a $10,000 grant from Blueprints for the Community. Blueprints for the Community, the donor advised fund of Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield Delaware at the Delaware Community Foundation has contributed over 21 million to the community since its inception in 2007. It was established to serve Delawareans with emphasis on, but not, to, not limited to, the needs of the uninsured and the underserved and to reduce healthcare disparities in minority populations and address social determinants of health. You can learn more at www.highmark.com forward slash blueprints. Now, without further ado, I will gladly pass this presentation on to our presenter, none other than Maggie Kalanick. Thank you, Cassandra. Welcome, love. Can we see, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. We're good. Okay. So like Cassandra said, my name is Maggie Kalanick and I am a speech language pathologist here in Delaware. Um, you might have heard speech therapists work in a variety of settings, but mine happens to be um, the area of neurocog, um, which is specialization in um, speech language and cognition um, and recovery from brain injury. So when thinking about what to present today, I thought what better than to 
explain what cognitive communication is and how to bring therapy home. Um, I see a lot of families that eventually insurance runs out and we know that brain injury is an ongoing and a long-term diagnosis. Um, so I wanted to give you guys some ideas on how to bring therapy home and how to look at activities of daily living in a little bit of a different way um, to see how much you actually are addressing um, these cognitive communication deficits um, by just daily, uh, the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that I am not associated nor receive any, um, any money or endorsements from the products in this presentation. Um, these are purely just uh, items that I use in my practice and that I encourage families to get at home. So I'm gonna move my thing out of the way. So the objectives of this presentation is to identify the role of the speech therapy in brain injury recovery to better understand cognitive communication, to identify activities to target cognitive communication on a daily basis, and to identify different ways to use games to target speech language and cognitive goals. So like Cassandra said, um, I started my career uh, at Baylor Health Care, in the Baylor Health Care System. Um, it was Baylor Health back in the day, now it's Baylor Scott and White, um, but I worked with some of the, the adult day program down there, and then I came home to Nemours, and I've been at Nemours since 2013, working in the a uh, rehab program there. So working with kids who have had a brain injury. Um, and then in 2018, I decided to start my own private practice on the side um, to really address and try to help our community get a little bit more support in brain injury recovery and advocacy. So I started Defy Therapy Services, um, which provides speech therapy services um, in the home. So what exactly is a speech therapist's role in brain injury recovery? So we look at a lot of different things when we're doing our evaluations. We look at speech. So we look at the voice. We look at their articulation, um, fluency. So how fluent you are in what you're trying to say, um, as well as does this patient need any augmentative communication device or something that will help them communicate while their voice is not working. Um, the other things that we look at are language. Uh, so what, are, what people are trying to say or express through ideas and feelings, reading and writing, um, pragmatics, which is a fancy word for social skills. Um, so we look at eye contact, personal space, body language, starting and maintaining conversations, um, cognition. So we look at the, speech and language in the context of cognition. So how does the attention play a role in your ability to say what you wanna say and understand what you're trying to listen to? How does memory play a role? Problem solving and reasoning, are you able to get all the um, important information? And then executive functioning. So are you even able to initiate? Um, are you able to self-monitor? Are you aware of the definite deficits? Um, and that type of stuff, as well as we do feeding. So looking at oral skills, pharyngeal skills, the swallow, and then making diet advancements as appropriate. So I just kind of wanted to uh, further define what speech and language is. So when we talk about language, it's a socially shared rule, uh, group of rules uh, made up of what words mean, how to make new words, how to put words together, and what word combinations are best in what situations. When we talk about speech, um, we're primarily talking about the verbal means of communication. Um, so while our title is speech therapist, we go way past just using verbal means of communication, but we look at communication as a whole. So nonverbal body language, if you don't have voicing, how can you best communicate? Um, and so it goes way beyond speech. Um, and then the term cognitive communication is the impact of cognition on speech and language skills. 
So following brain injury, there can be some fancy words that pop up in speech and language. Um, and I just wanted to kind of break this down. Uh, aphasia was difficulty producing and or understanding language. Apraxia is a motor disorder due to the inability to coordinate muscle movements of the lips, tongue, vocal folds, and diaphragm. Um, and dysarthria is a motor speech disorder due to reduced strength and mobility of the lips, tongue, vocal folds, or diaphragm. So the difference between apraxia and dysarthria is really the motor planning. So a lot of times folks who have apraxia know exactly what they want to say, um, but they can't get it out because the, all of the coordination it takes to put your lips and tongue and every everything together to get out the words are not working properly. So it's really more of that coordination. Um, whereas dysarthria is more of a weakness um, of the actual structure. So it's not necessarily the coordination of the structures, it's just the weakness and building that strength and endurance back up. Uh, aphasia, on the other hand, is more of that language. So this is when you'll see people who hear what you're trying to hear that you're saying something, but really have difficulty using language to interpret um, what they need to comprehend. Or even expressively, they may say the wrong words. They may have difficulty getting those words out. Um, but these uh, will pop up in and out of speech therapy for brain injury. And I just wanted to highlight what they were. Some deficits that we see in social interaction or pragmatics, um, we might see a, a flat affect um, or facial expression. So there's very little um, engagement of the face. So smiling, laughing, all that type of stuff to kind of give that nonverbal reaction. Um, they may have difficulty understanding or using nonverbal language. So um, they might have difficulty understanding facial expression. So what might look like to us, um, I'm really, I'm really excited to be here. We see that the facial affect does not match what the words are saying, but someone with a brain injury might not be able to put those two together and they might say, okay, he is excited to see me instead of taking that as, oh, they might be uh, a little sarcastic in what they're trying to portray. Um, body language also, they could be hard interpreting body language or showing body language. Um, the tone of voice may not match the emotion behind it. Um, and then respecting personal space or really reading social cues might be off. Um, in regards to conversation, that turn taking, we might see somebody jump more um, as jump in the conversation. So they might transition to a new topic without transitioning to a new topic. So they might be talking about one thing and then their brain switches to another and the conversation partner has to try to keep up. Um, they might have trouble turn taking, so often interrupting or completely walking away from a conversation in the middle of it. Um, those things that we do on a typical basis without really understanding. Um, and then sometimes we have to talk about appropriate versus inappropriate topics. Um, and it can be as small as uh, we don't discuss financial um, financial things with somebody we just met. Uh, or it might be you talk to your grandmother differently than you talk to your best friend. Um, and sometimes those lines can get blurred after a, a brain injury. Um, and then in addition, understanding humor or abstract language can be hard because people who have sustained a brain injury tend to be more concrete. They'll take you at your word. Um, and whereas I might say, you know, back to the example, I'm really excited to see you today, might have been sarcastic, and I really wasn't excited to see you, but they're not putting all those pieces together to understand that underlying humor or abstract language. Um, frequent cognitive deficits that we can see following a brain injury are uh, deficits in attention. So being able to focus on one thing at a time, being able to sustain that focus over a period of time, 
being able to alternate between um, two different stimuli. So for like the school age child, looking at their paper and then looking up at the smart board might be really hard for them to do. Um, and then divided attention, <coughs> excuse me, um, would be more of, you know, this is the extreme, but like driving. So are you able to press the pedal, monitor your speed, watch all the cars around you and then react when something happens? Um, so those are the progression of attention that we look at. Uh, memory, a lot, a lot, a lot of people tell me that their memory has been impacted after a brain injury. So whether it's remembering things in the short term, remembering things in the long term, like, you know, birthdays and who people are and um, that type of stuff, or even working memory. So being able to hold on to information as you're using it um, on a day to day basis. Um, problem solving and organization. Um, this is uh, more of your being able to get all the important facts. Are they able to get all the important facts? Are they able to eliminate what they don't need um, when problem solving? Are they able to weigh the facts? Like what, what is the the benefit of choosing one solution over the other? Um, and are they able to integrate all of that information to, to make a decision in the moment? Um, and then if you make a decision and it goes wrong, are you able to self-monitor and then change your approach if it's unsuccessful? Identifying what went wrong and what went right, um, and then listing out other options um, in that problem-solving strategy. Um, and then executive functioning is that overarching um, cognitive ability to initiate, to plan, to maintain goal directive behavior, to stop your impulse control. We see a lot of um, folks who have had brain injury who has have difficulty inhibiting what they want to do or inhibiting what they want to say. So a lot of people will tell me, oh, I have no filter anymore. I say whatever's on my mind, whether it's right or wrong. And, um, you know, I might not mean it, but I say it because I can't control myself. Um, so we can work on strategies to help with all of these types of things. Um, because if you think of all of these cognitive deficits, it's very important to be able to control and to be able to utilize language and speech in the midst of all this cognition to be successful at school, to be successful at, you know, maintaining employment, to be successful in, um, you know, even building and maintaining relationships. So all of these cognitive skills are important and bleed into speech language and social skills. So I wanted to put this in here because my, my goal of this presentation was to give you resources and give you things to think about um, when interacting with somebody who has sustained a brain injury, whether it's a patient, a client, a loved one, um, or even just, you know, someone you're just meeting. So I love this communication style identification chart um, that really allows us as the caregivers or as um, people who are interacting with that person to think about how am I communicating and how can I change my communication style to help this person better comprehend and interact with me. Um, so one of the things that we always tell caregivers is your average rate of speech, slow it down. However, I don't want you to slow it down so that you're talking to a 30 year old like you're talking to a three year old. There is a way to use age appropriate language, but slow down your rate of speech. When you slow down that rate of speech, it allows the the person to keep up with what you're saying and to be able to interpret and make appropriate responses. I also encourage caregivers to shorten the length and complexity of their sentences. So where we might say, go into the garage and grab the hammer and nails and bring it back into me. That might be too much for somebody who's sustained a brain injury. 
So what I would tell people is go into the garage and bring me a hammer. They come back. Okay, now that you have the hammer, let's go and we're going to hang up this, I don't know, picture or whatever it is you're trying to tell them. Break those steps into smaller, more simple directions so that they can take it in, process it, and then um, execute the what you need them to do. Uh, try to limit the use of sarcasm, humor, and puns. If you think about this, this is very hard for us to do. There are a lot of phrases in the English language that really rely on understanding of sarcasm and humor. So there are times, even in my practice, that I'll stop myself and say, okay, I just used a pun and I probably shouldn't have done that. They're looking at me like I have three heads. So keep things as concrete as possible because that is at the level of where they are right now. And then as they continue to improve, we start to add in more sarcasm and humor and puns if that's appropriate. Um, choose your words carefully, making sure that they're at the level of where the person is after the brain injury. Um, what is your level of attentiveness to the people during the conversations? I know we all have moments where we're doing six other things and we're not really attending to what they're saying. So at, at your best, making sure that you are able to attend and that person is able to attend back to get the best communication exchange possible. Um, organization of conversation. So keeping things simple and really highlighting when you're changing the conversation topic is helpful. Um, eliminating the use of hand gestures and body gestures if, if it's difficult for them to attend. If you're using your hands and you're saying, oh, this is how we do this, that's how we do that, the person on the other end might be watching more of your hands and saying, whoa, their hands are really flying around and not even attending to what you're trying to say. Um, but when you can use the environment and use objects in your environment to help explain things, um, even using a visual map, like first, I want you to get this, then I want you to bring this. So using one, two, three, kind of allowing them to, to make something concrete that wouldn't necessarily be concrete for them. Um, that you look at the manner of responding to questions that others ask you. So um, just making sure that you, you're matching the tone and the um, facial expression that you're trying to give off. Um, patience while waiting for someone else to talk or answer. A lot of times people who have sustained a brain injury need extra time or extended time to process what you're trying to ask them or tell them and then process and execute what their response is going to be. Um, we want to avoid as much as possible filling in answers for somebody who has had a brain injury because that number one takes away their ability to communicate. And number two, you're just assuming what they wanted to say. So just keeping that in mind. Um, and then just make sure you understand your ability to understand, understand your ability to understand communication efforts. So how does this person best communicate? Are they able to communicate verbally or do they need more you know, visual cues and visual supports to communicate back? Um, if you can, as a caregiver or as a therapist or as any type of um, you know, a friend of someone who's had a brain injury, these types of communication strategies can really change how you interact with that loved one and how much communication you would get back from them as well. I also talk a lot about factors that influence function. So caregivers, survivors, anyone who works with someone with a brain injury can say, you know what, yesterday they were able to do this so well and today they are falling apart. What the heck happened? Brain injury is not a smooth recovery. 
brain injury is an up and down roller coaster. So some days you're going to have really good days and some days you're going to have really bad days and some days you're going to be right there in the middle. Um, so just kind of understanding what is it that took my performance from up here to down here today. Um, a lot of times I will talk with patients and clients about how much sleep did you get last night? Are you distracted right now? Like, are you externally distracted? Is something going on in our environment that's really pulling your attention away from me and what we're doing? Are you internally distracted? Are you nervous about something? Are you upset? Are you having a bad day because you're just upset that this happened to you? Um, how many details do you have to consider at one time? Is this a, a task that's pretty relatively simple or do they have to take a lot of information and put it together to be successful? Is this something new for them? Is this something familiar? Usually familiarity is easier to do than a new or, or strange task that they haven't done before. Are they in pain? How much time do they have to focus on this? It, is it a test for a student where the time is allotted for 60 minutes and it might take them 90 minutes and they're worried about it? Or is this something that, you know, we can come back to and take breaks um, to allow for that cognitive and physical fatigue? So these as caregivers and as people who interact with those who've had a brain injury are so important for us to understand because this could make or break somebody's day and just saying, hey, you didn't sleep well last night. Let's do something that's a little bit easier today. Or, hey, I know you're really worried about your upcoming neuropsych eval. And let's talk through that so that you don't feel as in distracted and worried about it. And then we can move on with our day. So as a speech therapist and as a part of my um, private practice at Defy Therapy Services, I this past fall was doing something that was called Functional Friday. So I wanted to put out there and this is on Instagram. So just so you guys know where the context of these videos are coming from. But I wanted to put out there functional tasks that we may do every day. And I wanted to show you how many different cognitive and speech and language goals that you can hit just by doing those activities of daily living. So bear with me. Um, some of these, are, you know, might be back from Halloween or, you know, something may have been going on, but I wanted to show you the actual videos that I put up on Instagram because I think it's important to look at different things that we do and show you how many cognitive and language skills that you can hit without even knowing it. So here's our first video. It's um, a, about playing cards and this one in particular was about playing rummy. So let's take a look. Hey guys, happy functional Friday. Earlier this week, we posted on different ways you could use a deck of cards to address those speech and language and cognitive goals. And today I wanted to dive into a family favorite, um, a game of Rummy and show you how many different skills you can target just by playing a game together. Um, this is also really good for the older population because they grew up with cards and a lot of times it doesn't take too much coaxing to get them to participate. So take a look. Okay, so that it has to move pretty fast because if you guys are familiar with Instagram, you only have about a minute to get everything done. But you'll notice that just in that one hand of cards, I was having to organize, identify numbers, put light um, numbers together, put the same suits together. Um, I had to pay attention to what other people were putting down in the discard pile. I was having to um, plan and sequence what I would do next in the game of Rummy. Um, 
and then also, you know, you have those like term taking and all of those um, social skills as well. So that is just a brief introduction for cards of what you can work on at home. Hey guys, happy oh. functional Friday. Sorry. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, so <laughs> we happened in my family to have COVID during one of these functional Fridays. So I thought what better opportunity than to show you how many cognitive skills it takes to test yourself for COVID. So let's take a look at this one. Um, you know, if you, you just got to join them and this is the way our world is. And so let's see what we can accomplish just by testing ourselves for COVID. Hey guys, happy Functional Friday. Uh, whether we like it or not, COVID is still a thing. And so for many of us, that means taking these at-home tests maybe multiple times in a month. Um, so I thought we could take a look at one of these at-home tests and see how many speech, language, and cognitive goals that you can address uh, just by testing for COVID. So let's take a look. Plan and organize by making sure you have all the stuff you need for your kit. Then either read the directions or listen to somebody read them to you. The pictures can help with people who have reading difficulties. Use a timer for time management and memory. Attention to detail for a positive or a negative result. Stay healthy. Okay, so that was just testing yourself for COVID. So I love a good direction sheet. I think that it's great um, for people to be able to identify, identify the important information, um, pick out what you need and sequence the steps to uh, completing the task or doing any type of you know, game or anything like that. Um, the visuals are helpful. Okay, if you don't understand what the words are saying, can you use the visuals to figure out how to test yourself for COVID? And then what are the, de the details you have to look for? Like, hey, you can, this test will be ready in 15 minutes. Don't let it go past 20 minutes or it's not valid anymore. And is it one line or two line? What does two line mean? What does one line mean? So it's that real functional use of speech, language, and cognition that I you know, really like, despite having all this COVID going on, something, hey something has come out of it. Um, I wanted to throw this one in. This is more of your, you know, elementary school, small kids, um, some ways to use book reading to facilitate language um, at home. So these are my little guys, and they were helpful in helping me um, show you how to do speech and language with a book. Hey guys, happy Functional Friday. Um, this week I have a couple of helpers to show you guys how to use books and address those speech and language goals. So let's take a look. Hey, oh no. What's going on here? Look, the doggy in the blue car. Yeah, doggy in a blue car. And who's coming? Uh, where is it? Right on the front right there. Yeah, and what are they going to do? They're going to help the water. Uh, help that water down. This stuff getting to the water. Yeah, I think they're gonna clean up the park. What do you think? Why? Because it looks dirty. So, if you notice, we got all the WH questions in. We were using descriptive words. We were working on reasoning and predicting what was gonna happen. Um, all sorts of stuff. And it was just the first page of the book. So lots of great goals that you can hit with books. Oh, hey guys, geez. happy fun. Every time. Okay. Um, grocery shopping is a great task to do, um, especially for cognitive communication. So let's take a look at this one. Hey guys, happy Functional Friday. Today we're going to address cognitive communication um, at the grocery store. Uh, full disclosure, I am not your grocery store girl, but um, there are so many ways that you can use uh, a trip to the grocery store to work on your cognitive communication goals. Your first step is creating your grocery list. Now you can do it two ways. You can have somebody dictate the grocery list to you, or you can go through the cabinets yourself and figure out what you need. 
The next thing you want to do with your grocery list is break it down into categories. This will make it easier to remember and also help you organize as you walk through the grocery store. If you need to take it one step further, you can always map out where those categories are in your grocery store and plan which way you're going to go to be the most efficient in your grocery shopping. So obviously those are a lot of different steps that you can take and you can, you know, add or subtract based off of skill, but um, so many good cognitive skills, communication skills, and we haven't even stepped into the grocery store yet. Um, asking for help when you're in the grocery store, um, asking for items, um, interacting with the cashier. If you don't interact with the cashier, if you do the checkout, self-checkout, can you navigate that? Um, all great skills for someone who's had a brain injury. And it really works on facilitating that independence. So the next thing I wanted to touch base on pretty quickly, sorry, I'm watching my time here, um, is games. Uh, we have tons of great games and um, you can go on Amazon and buy games or you could just get a deck of cards out of the you know, drawer and target so many of your goals. So I wanted to look at some of my favorites um, and show you how you can play them in different ways to target whatever goal you're working on. So some benefits to playing games is that they're low cost. Um, you don't need insurance for approval. Um, no transportation needed usually if you have them at home. Um, they're fun and motivating. They're purposeful. It allows you to interact with somebody else. Um, if it's a kid, it provides a role for the siblings um, and it kind of brings everybody together. When trauma happens, it's really easy to fall apart as a family, um, bringing in games and really supporting the family as a unit can help really bring back um, the family together and support that person who's in recovery in their goals in a fun way. So some of my favorite um, games, I work at Nemours, remember that. So we really enjoy the games and um, targeting goals with games. But Taboo is a great game to work on um, naming and uh, speed of processing and thinking under a time pressure. Um, but if you've never played this game, you have, they give you a word and then underneath they give you a couple of associated words and you're supposed to get the, your team to guess the top word without saying any of the words underneath. Um, so usually you would play with a timer and you see how many words you can get your team to guess without using any of the words underneath, um, on the card. But, um, some modifications that you could do is sometimes I allow the kids or the, um, the adults, because this comes in taboo junior and it comes in regular taboo, but sometimes I'll allow them to, to read out loud the words that are underneath, um, or we don't use a timer, or we, instead of using the words, I'll have them act it out, um, or we work as a team. Um, so the nice part about this is one, you can have an expressive language goal. So how do they get you to say the word? And you could also have a receptive language goal. So if I'm giving them clues, can they put all of that information together and come up with the word that I'm trying to get them to guess? Categories is another great one. Um, this is more of a category game um, where you would roll a die and um, you could have the letter and then you have to be able to come up with words that begin with that letter based off of the, the cue card. Um, so for this one, you could take away the die and so you could just have people come up with words um, based off of just randomness. Um, you could get rid of the timer. You could work together in teams. Um, you could give them sound clues. So like um, if it was name an animal at the zoo, you could say Z and see if they could get zebra or um, 
for snake, or you could you could have them listen and say, this is an animal that has orange or black stripes that is um, a big cat and lives at the zoo and they have to come up with tiger. So you're using all of these types of strategies that we would use for word finding and um, expressive and receptive language just in that game. Um, blurble is the same type of thing. It's a word finding, visual processing, sound and letter awareness um, type game. But again, you can <clears throat> change it by naming a word with the same first letter. You could name a word with the same sound. You could generate a sentence with the word in it or name as many as you can under a time pressure. So there's multiple ways to use all of these games. These are just a few. Um, catchphrase is a great one. It's, it tends to be more of a higher level cognitive game because of, you can't really control the time. Um, gestures is um, the acting out. So kind of giving the patient or client a different way to get their point across when, when words are taken away. Um, and then Pictionary is the same type of thing. Can they draw it out? If they can't draw, can they explain it? If they can't explain it, can they act it out? If they can't act it out, how could they? So you, you're making the, all of those changes based off the, the skill level of the person that you're playing with because the number one goal is that they're being successful and enjoying the game. So I would really encourage everyone to, to think outside of the box and see how they can include somebody and make it fun and work they'll be working on these skills regardless of whether they're aware or not headbands is another great one um, guess who is another great one all are just fabulous games for deductive reasoning um word finding I, I could go on and on for days and hours about these games but um all are great games to really pull in those speech language and cognitive goals. Um, just for the little kids, uh, Mr. Potato Head's a great one to use. So following directions, are they able to put the potato head together if they put it in the wrong place? Are they able to say where it is? Um, Play-Doh, you could do a million things with Play-Doh. Simon Says, 20 Questions, I Spy. All of these are really good games, even in the car, to, to practice all of these um, cognitive communication strategies and goals. These are some other great games that we use at Nemours and that I use in my private practice. Um, Uno, it's the biggest therapy game I've ever seen. Everybody loves Uno. Um, Spot It, Battleship, Tribond, Outburst, Scrabble, all are great games. So what I really want to do is just encourage everybody to, to take a look at the games that you may have in your closet and see how you can even just pull out a new game and read the directions or a game that you haven't played in a while, have your loved one read the directions and teach you, try to teach you how to play or, you know, you read the directions out loud to them. Um, are they able to hold on to the, to the gameplay instructions? Um, and are they able to engage in this game, even if modifications have to be put in place? So um, that is the end of my presentation. Here are some great resources um, for brain injury um, in general, and obviously one of them is the Brain Injury Association of Delaware. But, um, and I guess right now I'll open it up to any questions, um, and I appreciate your time. Fantastic. Thanks, Maggie. Um, Debbie, did you have any questions? Roger, did you have any questions? You guys can feel free to chime in or enter them into the chat. <clears throat> uh, no. Okay, so Debbie noted no questions. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, and actually, thanks, Debbie, for saying that. Great presentation, Maggie. One of the things that I thought about as you were presenting was, is it possible that most of these symptoms don't only apply to brain injury survivors? Yes. Because I was going through and I was like, wait a minute, I have a list. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And then some of these things, 
that I mentioned, we do on a daily basis that we don't even realize, but right. not everybody comes to the table with the same strategies. So even engaging in conversations about what were the strategies that you used before? Can we use these you know, again, after your brain injury, or do we have to do something a little bit different? So a lot of times it takes a lot of trial and error. Um, but it just, you know, everybody can be successful. I guess that's my main, my main idea of this whole presentation is that you're doing all of this cognitive work on a day-to-day -day basis. And after a brain injury, you don't necessarily need to see a speech therapist for 18 years after. You're doing all of this stuff in the community and you're, you're able to address all of these goals and work on strategies by just going out in your community. Awesome, awesome. Almost as a sense of we need to just normalize, hey, yep. these are the effective ways of communicating. Absolutely. So let's not segregate the fact that somebody has an injury somebody doesn't but more so put it into a practice to where it's acceptable and everybody is doing the same so yeah. others don't feel left out right these are the yes. major things that happen i'm pretty sure that you've seen in mm -hmm. um survivors and support groups and you know yeah. through your um agency is that you know a lot of people a lot of times survivors might not have that um energy or even enough strength to speak out on, hey, this happened and I need help with this, but yeah. more so we're letting them, you know, stay behind and just being like, hey, you need to do this after this injury, more so than maybe just saying, hey, this is what I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. because I want to make sure I'm not, you know, getting something that I didn't need at the store. I want to make sure that I am, you know, relatively uh, keeping the information that I'm learning in my mind and repetitive. Absolutely. Absolutely. I tell all of my clients, I 90% of the time, I do not ask you to do something that I don't do in my own life. It's just adding the structure where we need, we need help. And that is the key to success in a lot of this too. Awesome. So, um, <laughs> Debbie noted, uh, I surely will, Debbie. She wanted us to post your contact information, um, email and agency. I will surely do that in the follow-up email, Debbie. And then she said, uh, we see people at Brookhaven who would never have needed our inpatient level of care if they'd been allowed more coverage of PT, OT, and SLP. We mm -hmm. need to lobby for increased coverage of these valuable services. Absolutely. I totally agree, Debbie. I think that we are unfortunately very limited by insurance. And that's why a lot of our first reactions as therapists is how much can we instill in the caregivers? And that's even if they have a reliable caregiver, because you know, if we can provide all this information to the caregiver, we know that somebody is advocating for them when that insurance runs out. So you're absolutely right. It It's definitely an uphill battle with insurance. And I can't say that it's going to get any easier anytime soon. Cheryl, did you have anything? No, um, thank you so much, Maggie. Very informative, very interesting. Um, a lot of good information. So thank you so much for joining us. You're uh, welcome. I've been excited for this presentation since we booked you. So I'm just thrilled to have you and we appreciate all your hard work. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And Roger, did you have anything? Give you a couple minutes to chime in. All right. Maybe not. Well, I won't hold anybody any further. Thank you, Maggie, so much. We truly appreciate you spending time with us today, as we said earlier. Thank you for the information you shared. It was very helpful, and we've learned a lot about the brain injury community. As a follow-up from today's webinar, all participants will receive an email <clears throat> with a copy of our 2022 webinar schedule as well as uh, shared links that Maggie presented on earlier, as well as her contact information. You can also expect to receive a link of the recording of this webinar 
and any resources discussed as well. Please feel free to share this information with friends, family, and colleagues. Remember to visit the BIAD website resource center page for additional support. We'd like to, we'd like to invite everyone to join us next month, Tuesday, June 21st at 2.30 for our next Educate Delaware series webinar. Our guest presenter will be Haresh Sampath Kumar from Delaware Physiatry. Please mark your calendars and plan to join us. Thank you for attending today's webinar. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Have a wonderful day, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining. Bye. Thank you.